Today, I have Zach Rader on the show. We're going to be talking about breath work, uh, meditation, different types of healing modalities, and how to work with and understand your intuition. It's a beautiful talk. Zach has a great approach to switching the way that we contextualize our stories into something positive as an opportunistic instead of something as a detriment. So I really love this conversation. Hope you get something out of it. We'll see you on the other side. But first, a message from our sponsor. Anamkara is a gorgeous meditation and healing center offering daily in-person and virtual services to help bring you back to the center of who you truly are. They serve through a collective of practitioners, healers, and teachers, offering daily meditation classes, one-on-one healing sessions, workshops, personal ceremonies, and private events, plus corporate and team training, all with mindfulness at the core. The center itself is located in the heart of downtown Spokane. Every part of it was built, designed, and curated for you to drop into your calm place. They have a large community space for daily meditation classes and workshops, as well as two one-on-one healing rooms, a community kitchen to gather for tea, plus a well-stocked apothecary for you to gather all of your self-care and ritual needs. Hannah Talbot, the owner and founder of Anamkara, dreamed of opening this space for years. It is her ultimate manifestation, and she cannot wait to share it with those in the Spokane community, but also through the virtual ethers, wherever you may be. Pop in for a class today. You can follow them on Instagram to book and stay up to date. Check out the website, the full schedule, meet the practitioners, and view all the offerings. Visit them at anamkarahealing.center. Anamkara, may you be nourished and ignited. Our healing journey can be difficult and might feel lonely at times. That's why I love sound baths. When we can get together in a community, we intrinsically support and feel supported by others. And that combined energy can help us go deeper into our own healing journeys. And all you have to do is just lay there for one hour and listen to beautiful healing sounds. I'm a sound healing practitioner, and I hold sound baths on a regular basis in the greater Seattle area. You can find my next sound baths on my website at adamrealhealing.com. That's Adam, A-D-A-M, real, R-I-E-H-L, healing, H-E-A-L-I-N-G, dot com. Adamrealhealing.com. Your healing is worth your time. And now an uninterrupted podcast with Zach Rader. All right, welcome back to our show. Uh, Today I'm talking with Zach Rader. Uh, Zach is an international teacher, speaker, and healer. And uh, I believe you're from the Sedona area, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, uh, Zach was introduced to me by another friend, Hannah, who uh, Hannah has been just a real gem uh, finding guests for my show. Uh, and uh, I believe that you've just come off a little bit of a, a tour and you were in Washington. Unfortunately, I missed you in person. Um, you know, I had to go down to Texas and, and uh, handle some family stuff. But I'm really happy to have you uh, virtually on the, on the show today. So thank you so much for your time, Zach. I really appreciate you, brother. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. So you, um, you're in the midst of kind of a, a, a tour right now. Um, you're back home for a bit, and then you're going to be in Vegas for a little while. Um, so what is, what's your what's your tour that you're working through right now? Uh, it, it's a lot of breath work. Mm. So, so I'm doing breath work events all over the place, which uh, got shut down a little bit the last couple of years. People didn't want to breathe as much around each other. Yeah. So it's really, really refreshing to be back out there again and working with a bunch of people. Yeah, and I bet the, the the vibe has to be really, really energized to be within community again, to have that sangha, to be you know able to have this stuff in person instead of virtually again, for both you and for the practitioners. I'm I'm sure there's like this beautiful energy of like, oh my god, we get to heal as a group again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like I'm. It's, I mean, it's people are people are just ready for even more in in everything. I think, and so it's been just really powerful and you know, the, the openings and the, the awakenings and the healings and everything that are happening are really beautiful. Yeah. With, uh, the work that I do, I, I don't, I'm not breath work practitioner, but I do energy work on my end. And, um, and I, I feel the same way. There's, there's been this, um, I think this realization of how much healing needs to be done now that the, the, once the pandemic hit and people had a chance to slow down and kind of assess what's going on in their lives. And, uh, the unfortunate thing was uh, a lot of those healing modalities were not available in person at that time when people mm-hmm. were starting to go through their stuff. So, you know, luckily, you know, there are some things that we can do online and virtually to, to get the point across and to offer what we can, whether it's a virtual, you know, energy session, uh, breath session, things like that. But to have that opportunity to be in person again and to feel that energy of everybody healing together, you know, we're all on our own paths, but when we get together as a group, we get that, that magnified energy and there's something special about that. You know, I've I've been having some, uh, you know, a lot of the sound baths that I do around this area have gone from, you know, five to seven people up to, you know, 50 or 60 people now. And, um, and that the energy, that, that shift of energy and that, that impulse and that, 
um, that healing path that people are on really is, you know, and I can palpably feel it now that we have those groups that are becoming a little bit bigger and people that are stepping into their healing that might not have had an idea that they had trauma that they wanted to deal with before. Now they're having that opportunity and they're finding these communities and it, it's just beautiful to see the offerings be, be received, you know, and, and to feel the excitement for people that are on this hard path that is really, really is work. And it's the worst four letter word out there, but it's the work that nobody's going to do except for us, you know? So we've got to yeah. lift those boulders and we've got to, we've got to do that work ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, well, it's, it's, it's what we came here to do. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. I was talking, I was talking to someone the other day. It's like, say it was, say you got to heal every single piece of personal trauma that you've ever been through. Well, now you're just working on your ancestral. Now you're just working on the collective. It's like mm-hmm. it's there. There's there's always something to open up and and uh, like like bring some more space into. Definitely, I have a yeah. friend that was talking to me about something like that, and he said, uh, you know, when you start your healing path, you're you're healing seven generations prior to you, and you're setting up the healing for seven generations after you. You know, because like you said, you know, a lot of our relatives they didn't maybe realize that they were going through trauma. They maybe they didn't have the time to understand that you know, the, the great depression was a very traumatic experience for everybody, you know, and now that we've gotten past that, you know, we're healing our great grandparents trauma from having to go through that, the, you know, the racisms, the, the wars that have happened, the, you know, the, the colonizations, like all these things that have been happening since, you know, that go lineage back in all of our histories, you know, as we start to do our work, some of that stuff starts to get unraveled too. And then we can start to set up our kids and our kids, kids, and, you know, the people that are around us for those next few generations of healing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, with uh, with breath work, what type of uh, what type of breath work are you practicing right now? Um, the I I mean I, I've been uh, I, I found breath work over twenty years ago, so mm-hmm. I've been doing it almost my entire adult life. Yeah. Um, uh, I've come every one I every one I've found, I think I've tried. So I've done all kinds. The one, the 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 one that I mostly work with when I teach is a, a circular connected or or like a rebirthing style. Mm. So we're you know, it's done in Shavasana, you're on the ground, really flooding the body with life force and that, and that extra life force is, is going to go heal. It's going to, going to, you know, open things up. It's going to, to work through things. And so, um, you know, so many different experiences can happen once, once you get that much prana going in your body. Um, yeah. and, and it just always knows it's like, what would be the thing that serves us the most that day? So mm. that's beautiful. Yeah. Holotropic breath work is one of the most intense medicines, I guess I should say that, that I've ever experienced, you know, I, I like to sit with plant medicines, um, psilocybin mainly for big, big journey work and, you know, to try to get those big boulders moved. But I remember the first time I tried holotropic breath work, I, I was flabbergasted at the experience that I had and the, the journey that I went on and just, you know, my own personal experience, but also I was in a group of about, <clears throat> about 15 people and, and, just auditorily being witness to other people's experiences, you know, the, the loud wailings that were going on in different variations of the room and the, the people hitting the mattress that they were on and just having their own experiences, you know, while I was, it was like the soundtrack of my own experience, you know, and it was, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my experience wasn't as intense as what I was hearing somebody, some of the other folks going through, but that was like, I think it was fueling my experience, you know, the energies from that, um, you know, helped me get deeper into the place that I was going to. And I, whoo, man, from the, from the guide that guided us through that, that, that breath work to the, 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 the fellow practitioners that were with us, the soundtrack, the whole experience was, uh, was just such an amazingly beautiful and life-changing experience for me. And I, you know, just really profess that to everybody that, that has some kind of healing journey, like try breath work, try these different modalities out there. Cause you never know which one's really going to land with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, it's like, I think breath should be included in, in anything, uh, whatever it looks like. Right. It's like any, any good, any practitioner in anything is like, Hey, tap into your breath. Cause it's just going to, it's just going to enhance whatever it is that we're doing or open up the energy even more. So yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah. Do you work with children by chance? Um, I do work with some. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. yeah that's one thing with, uh, you know, that, that that's a topic that's kind of come up a bunch on this show is, how that we, we have these better understandings of how our, you know, how our nervous systems work, our parasympathetic, our sympathetics, you know, we have all these understandings now, uh, for, for what we know, but we're still not readily teaching this to, you know, to kids growing up to, to how to self-regulate their systems, to how to, you know, get themselves out of anxiety and depression from, from our breath work or from meditation or from some type of movement practice. 
Yeah, I agree. It should be taught like as soon as as soon as we're teaching them anything, like start start working on the breath and realizing it's like, oh wait, I can I can actually relax and calm myself down. Um, you know, when 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 I find myself out of balance or when I found myself wound up, it's like, hey, hey, what's my breath doing? Right. Like if if that was just a check in that everybody had, that would that would probably change a lot of things. Yeah, definitely. You know, and my kids are, you know, I started that, that work with my kids when they were in their teens and uh, teenagers are very hard to adapt to things that might seem silly. And uh, I can honestly say that some of the breath work that I've been a part of have, you know, it seems silly, but you know, at the same time, like what's my, what am I gauging that silliness against? It's my own, uh, my own discomfort you know, of stepping towards something that like ecstatic dance where I'm like, well, I'm not doing it right. Well, there's no way to do it wrong. It's ecstatic dance. You just feel your body and you move with it. You know, so trying to introduce a lot of this stuff to my kids when they were teens, uh, you know, it took a little while for it to land, but you know, slowly but surely we're, we're starting to sneak that stuff in there to where it's acceptable. But I think, you know, if we can start to teach these kids at the age of like five, that if you have nervous energy in your body and you shake, you know, for like two, two to like five seconds, just get that energy out, you know, do a full body shake and then just go on with your day. If everybody's doing that, then it's not so silly. Right. You know, so, and if it's working for you and it's, you're finding results with it, then who cares if it's silly? Yeah, totally. I, I, I agree. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I live in Sedona, and so it's um, you know, the culture is uh, a lot of little kids know a lot of really cool spiritual practices. So that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful, man. Well, for yourself, man, you uh, you kind of went through a series of awakenings um, in your early time of your your healing that helped progress you to where you're at now. Um, and I love l just listening to people's journeys. That's one of my favorite things. So do you mind talking about, you know, some of those series awakenings, some of those, you know, interesting moments that happened around your, your healing that kind of progressed you to where you're at now? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, 10,000 awkward things, but, um, <laughs> but, but there was some big, um, you know, one of the things that, that, um, that really, really opened me up and, you know, changed everything, uh, it was, you know, in, in 2012, I was, I was going through these, just having these really interesting sensations in my body. Like, you know, there was, there was weeks and especially I was already doing healing work at the time, but there would be, you know, just have like, I felt like cold water was pouring through my hands mm. and like all the time I'd always be wiping off my hands thinking they were soaking wet and they never were. Um, and it was like the start of like really paying attention to my hands and, and it would turn up in healing sessions and it would be like, wow, this is really interesting. And then, you know, a combination of, um, you know, there was an incredible conversation that I had that made something click. Someone just said, you know, a sentence that just really opened me up. And, and all of a sudden it was like, I just started to almost, almost like have, have a deeper knowing of, of what this all is. And when I started to drop into that, it kind of, um, blew me apart for a bit. Mm. And, and so there was just there there was there was so much energy moving through my body that um, that I, I you know wasn't the best functioning of it for a little bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got I was I, I but I was also enjoying everything I was at, and so you, you might catch me just staring at a wall for a while, and just like enjoying enjoying myself so much because I was just I was just taking it all in. Yeah. Um, that became you know, that, that kept sh teaching me and showing me, me things. And it became like part of the healing work that, 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 that I started doing even more, which was, you know, whatever the frequencies or energies are, I started calling them space. Mm -hmm. I, I just referred to them as space. Cause it's like, they weren't like energies. If we, if, if, if we look about energy, it was kind of like energy is the positive and negative. It's the polarity or the right or the wrong we often get stuck and bouncing back and forth between that. And so there's a, there's this frequency that I've just been calling space forever. Mm -hmm. It kind of comes in and, and really just dissolves and, and opens that up and, and creates a bigger, a bigger space or a bigger field. Wow. And now, now that energy doesn't affect us the way that it used to. Wow. And that was that an intuitive kind of thing that as that energy started to come in and you put the label of space onto it, um, kind of intuitively just kind of let that grow and let that understanding kind of gnosisly come into side to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it, it was a learning journey. It's like, I, I think, you know, for years and years and years, it would still, still be showing me something new or, or opening up something different. Um, you know, I used to, right after it happened, I was really like, my reality was so shifted. There was definitely three weeks where I felt just, I, 
I didn't believe in any of this stuff. I felt like everything felt like a dream. And I, I was very aware that I was the dreamer of the dream. Wow. Um, before that, you know, I, I joke around sometimes that, you know, bef- I, I've never felt exactly what I used to call sober sense. Mm. Like before that moment, it was just like, it was a new, there's been a new experience with everything where it's not as, it's like just, just, just knowing that everything is so much more than, than what we see and what we think it is. Right. Did you have a spiritual practice or a religious practice before you had this kind of awakening or these series of awakenings? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, about 18 years old, I, I grew up without religion. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, about 18 years old, I just knew there was something out there and I, and I wanted to find it. And so I really, I dove in hardcore to reading every possible book I could and taking every course in class. And I did that for 12 or 13 years. Um, and I, and I understood a lot of stuff. Okay. I, I had a lot of books memorized or whatever, but I was still miserable. And <laughs> I, I was, I was, I used to be very analytical, like very analytical to that point. It's like, Oh yeah, it's, it's all about knowledge and you just figure it out and you're going to, that's going to get you what you want. And, and I, I feel like I needed to do that long enough to prove to myself that that's not the way. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're talking to me directly right now. <laughs> uh, man, I, I did something very similar when I started on my path. I, I didn't grow up with any religion. Um, you know, didn't really have a spirituality, didn't, didn't want to give enough time to think outside of myself is what I kind of finally kind of uh, realized for myself. But when I did find, um, you know, the, the spiritual path for myself, I, I dove into books and I figured that was okay. Let's just read books. I can just read all these books. And I, I think I realized about three, three or four years into it that with the exception of like, you know, maybe a small handful, I probably went through about 150, maybe close to 200 books in that time. And, uh, and I, with the exception of maybe a small handful, I, I think I was just reading for the sake of reading. You know, it was just like a new addiction for me, you know, mm-hmm. but, but in a way I had to switch that addiction to something, what was seemingly more positive, even though I wasn't retaining that knowledge at the time. Uh, you know, I've, I've gone back and read a number of those books again, because, you know, in this different mindset, as I'm retaining knowledge, it actually landed in a different way. But, you know, a lot of times in the beginning, I was just reading for the sake of reading, you know, just, I think just to try to get my mind in, in a different place and uh, try to understand what I could understand, even though I wasn't understanding all of it. And so just like ravishly reading through books just for the sake of reading. Um, but now, you know, I try to go back through and, and when I do read these, um, you know, books that I know will land with me in a special way, I try to take notes with them. You know, I read them, I take notes and I, you know, try to underline and highlight and reference back and things like that. So I at least, you know, for my, my own personal, uh, growth pattern, at least I feel like I'm doing something positive with that reading, trying to seat the knowledge instead of just reading the words on the page, just to read the words on the page. Yeah. Well, and it's like the, you know, the, the knowledge, it's like when there's a knowledge that resonates with us, it's like, oh yeah, that's, that, that feels really good. It's like, that's because part of you already knows that's, it's like part of you already knows that it's like what they're saying is pointing at something that I know is true. Mm. It's not necessarily the exact words or the exact way that we understand it, but that that knowledge is pointing at something that I know is true. Mm, I love that. And, and so it might not be to, you know, it might not be those exact combination of words or whatever. You know, to, also during that time, um, you know, I, I was still waking up from, from being, being very analytical and I was doing a healing session with somebody and it was like this voice came in that was like, if you can understand it, that's not what it is. Mm. And that became, that became my mantra for quite, quite some time of just catching myself of like, look at how I think I have this figured out and look at how I, look at how I think I've got this whole thing, this whole situation figured out. And it was like to actually feel the energy of when I think I have something figured out, it's like, it's really small and tight and dense. Mm. And, and it was all these places of like, wait, if that's, if that's, maybe that's not what I think it is. And it actually like, Oh wow. And then, it, then it actually opens up space with it. And, and I might discover a lot more things about it. It might feel a totally different way when I actually drop into like, Hey, what, what if it's bigger than that? Mm. So that's, that's, I love that because you know, what you were just saying is that, you know, what you quote unquote thought you had figured out was this small little speck, but what your awakening showed you is that space is everything. Right. And so, yeah. 
that uh, that's I love that because that's like playing with your own uh, intuition, right? And you're just figuring out how your intuition is talking to you. You know, the space, the the openness of what that awakening showed you is much much vaster and much more complicated than this little speck of I got it figured out. You know, mm. and so the opportunities and the ideas are much more much more vast with that spiritual idea than the I've got it I've got it pegged. You know. Yeah. And one of the things I tell people, it's like when, when they're in a healing process or working on something or, you know, or it's finances or whatever, we, it's like, we think we know what's wrong, right? Hmm. Oh, well, I just need more money or I just need to heal this thing or whatever. And it's, um, that's often what's getting in the way of the actual healing. Hmm. And so it, it, it's usually bigger than that. And, you know, after, after workshops or retreats, I, I let people know it's like, Hey, when, when stuff comes up after this, cause it will, um, you know, we think we, we have this feeling in our body and, and it's like, oh, I know what that is. That's anger. And I must be angry because of something and our mind is quick to blame it on something. <laughs> this is what this is. And this is why it is. And so I always give people, I love the question. What if this doesn't mean what I think it means? Mm. And it's an opportunity to set aside the narrative or the story for a little bit and really be with the essence of what this is. Wow. And that's because what, Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that's that's really hard for us to do because we've we're so good at spitting stories and we love stories. Humans love to have stories, you know. So yeah. when we get our our mind gets into these stories, we just start to follow them, not realizing we're also penning them as we're following them, and then yeah, all yeah. of a sudden we're in this rabbit hole of shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and stories aren't bad. Stories are beautiful. Like stories, stories make the world even more gorgeous. Mm. Um, we've just been taking so many of them. A little, a little more seriously, or a little too seriously. Yeah, I, I love to remind people, you know, that we we have these wonderful minds, and they're incredible, right? They're they're so good at doing what they do, but they're also not good at everything, right? right? They also have limitations, and so our our minds actually need context. They need beginnings and endings. They need boxes and um, structures and um, you know, that that's not the case. It's like infinite is infinite has no beginnings or no endings. Right. And so our mind is not capable of understanding infinite under, you know, it, it gets it as a concept, but it can't actually grasp something that has no beginning or ending. Right. And so I always remind everybody that who we really are, what we really are, why we're really here is beyond any story we could put to it. And so it's cool to have a story, but, but let it be bigger than that. Right. I just watched a documentary last night on Netflix called The Art of Infinity, and it has a series of mathematicians, theoretical physicists, and you know a lot of a lot of folks, statisticians that talk are talking about the the idea of infinity, and uh, and how vast we think infinity is, and um, you know they have all these different you know suggestions and ideas out there, and and it was you know I I kind of got the grasp of infinity, you know like I you know we hear it all the time, it's the biggest number, but what really kind of screwed me up is when they started talking about how there's something bigger than infinity. And I'm like, wait a minute. Whoa. Okay. So, and again, it's those questions that we, we don't think to ask until we hear them, you know, like what was around before the big bang? You know, I love the, the opening line of the Tao is the Tao is older than God. You know, it's like, whoa, Jesus Christ. I didn't think about that. Like what's before God, you know? So I love those, those, those posing those questions to kind of break up the continuity that we think we have figured out up here and then we just pose a different question that in a way kind of shatters our reality in, in, a, in a beautiful way and it's like oh god i i don't have it figured out and that's beautiful right because nobody's gonna ever have it all figured out totally when i was a little kid um that was it was like before i knew any of this i used to love this have this experience of blowing my own mind hmm and it would just be, it would be like, how, you know, I would just stare at space and be like, how was, how was there no end at space? Or like, if there was an end, what would it be? Oh, it's a wall. What's on the other side of the wall? And it would just be like, your mind just <laughs> can't do it. And, and I would get to a place where it just blows open and it would just be, it just, you know, now, now I would call it just like sitting in pure presence. Mm. That's that, that was that was a game I used to play when I was a kid. <laughs> That's a, yeah, as a kid too. I mean, like we love blowing our own minds, but just to have those thoughts as a child, like that's, that's so vast, you know. I think the, you know, it's it's kind of like us trying to have like a cat understand quantum physics, you know. For them to understand quantum physics is like for our brain to understand the vastness outside of what we understand as physics and what we understand like that happens in in our physical realm. 
um, you know, maybe we're just not capable of understanding like things like what happens in a black hole after you pass the event horizon. Like maybe our brains mm-hmm. just can't compute that because that's just not the way we were designed. You know, maybe that's yeah. that, you know, next level as we, as we progress and as we start to, you know, evolve as humans or whatever beings that are out there, then we start to, you know, grasp the concept of, you know, these, these bigger, uh, theories that are out there. But right now with the brain that we have, we can only get, you can only get so much. Yeah, it's like there's no limits to what we can know, but there is limits to what our mind can understand. That's beautiful. I love that. That's beautiful. You uh, you mentioned something earlier about um, you know when we're when we're turned on to something, it's uh, it's kind of like we're remembering or we're being reminded of something, and uh, and I that's I actually have the word remember tattooed on my fingers and um, facing me, so it's, it's it's a reminder for me. And, uh, you know, it, it, that, that concept really hits me a lot. You know, we have that remembering of, I'm remembering the fact that I was passionate about something that I'm now remembering that I'm learning, right? So think about past life regressions, right? So like I'm in this life now stepping towards sound work and it, it's beautiful and it lands in a special way to me. And in a way, it, it, it makes me feel like this is something that I've experienced in the past in my past lives that was very, very big part of it. And now I'm finally to a point in this life where I can remember how magical that experience is and, and embrace that and now utilize that as a practice. But also the, the fact of like being a member and remembering that person, right? So we're like putting our pieces back together as a human being of the things that we're passionate about, of the things that, that we want to utilize in this current life, you know? So there's like that double meaning of that word remember, but it always, you know, it just, it's this beautiful thing about us putting ourselves back together with the memories, the thoughts, the ideas, the concepts, everything that, that has gotten us successful in our previous lives that we've wanted and willed ourselves to remember in this life, but we can't make ourselves. We have to lead ourselves to that own path ourselves. And so now that we're finding that, that's when that, like the goosebumps happen and that, that inner side, that inner energy lights up whenever you, you know, like when I got tuning forks, I'm like, I got tuning forks because I just felt impelled to, right. And then I started to utilize them. I'm like, Oh my God, these feel so natural. And I feel like I know exactly where they need to go and what to do with them and how to utilize these in my practices to help people, you know, with, with little to no training. It was just one of those intrinsic things that, that, that I was drawn to that I got and I started to utilize. And I, you know, as I've opened myself up and quieted my mind down a lot, um, a lot of those things have started to, to approach me, whether it's knowledge base or, you know, people that have entered in my life or whatever it is, you know, there's these beautiful things once, once we can, we can, we can quiet down the internal thoughts and that internal chatter, that monkey brain that goes from, you know, thought to thought, these beautiful kind of messages start to come in, you know, and it's just mm-hmm. trying to figure out how to stay quiet enough and how to understand what the messages are coming in that are external and what messages my ego is just trying to whisper to me and, and mask as a message. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and again, uh, one of the, I think one of the things of that is, is the way that they feel. Mm. Right. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm such a huge feeler. I think feeling is, is everything. It's like, that's, that is a language. that is so much more intelligent than our mind could ever be. Mm. And so it's, it's got such a bigger perspective that can take in so much more information. And so that's a very much, um, very connected to intuition, very connected to our awakening because right. And intuition comes from, you know, that, that doesn't come from the mind. That's, that's the logical thing. You know, and everyone's intuitive. And I always joke around my favorite way that we know that is everyone, everyone you hear them saying, it's like, I knew I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> hey, there was, a, there was this, there was this something that they knew, but logically they knew something else. And so they did, they did, they went with logic and did something else. But, uh, but, but we all know, right. Yeah. And, and, and tapping into, into the feeling of things is, is a tremendous, like for so many people, it's like, okay, cool. I, I start following the feeling and, and yeah, like, wow, I just find myself knowing all kinds of things. Yeah. And d- did you grow up in a intuitive, encouraging environment? Like, were you encouraged to listen to yourself? Uh, was that something taught to you or is that something that you kind of learned as you started to awaken yourself? Um, it, it was probably something that, that happened like later, like I would say after knowledge and after I started, um, yeah, like, like, like getting to know all these different parts of me. And so feeling and realizing, um, you know, I, I'm sure there was, I, I'm sure many, right. I'm sure many things touched on that and showed me things through, throughout the time. But, um, but no, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing for the first half of my life for sure. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, um, the in- intuition, especially being a logical person, um, you know, I, I, I err on the side of logic myself, at least I have in the past, but it, that's been a hard thing for me to kind of um, switch over from that logic, the logistics kind of like, oh, let me just figure out why that is the way it is and why I felt it here at this time and I didn't feel here at this time. But uh, but quieting that mind down to really listen to those subtle energies and the, you know, that, that those little movements in our intuition has been, it's been a bit pretty tough path for me, you know? So for, for a logical, like intellectual, like how did you finally get the, the brain, convince the brain that it's not the one that needs to be in charge and finally start to listen to those subtle energies? Was it the, the, that, that cold water feeling that you had in your hands that kind of initially started it off? Um, I, you know, I'm, I think that's been, um, that's been developed over a very long time. I would say like it's, but, but I always tell people to just start with the simple stuff, right? Like, you know, the biggest decision of your life, it's like, if that's the first time we're, tra- we're tapping into intuition, like that's terrifying, right? Cause <laughs> at, at that point, like your logic is trying to protect you from intuition, right? Mm-hmm. Cause it's like, it doesn't understand it. It doesn't understand where it's coming from. It doesn't understand if it works or not. And so, um, logic is trying to protect us from intuition at first. And so it's like, play with a bunch of little, play with little stuff, play with things that don't matter. It's like, Hey, where are my keys? You know, when you feel it's like, are they in the bedroom? Are they in the hallway? Are they in the kitchen? And it's like, Oh, there's something, the kitchen has an interesting feeling to it, or there's something, something unique about the kitchen. And it's like, okay, maybe my keys are in the kitchen. And then I go to the kitchen and find them there. Hmm. And it's like, okay, cool. I, I knew my keys were in the kitchen. Okay. And it's like, you just start playing with that and ev- you start playing with that and everything and do it with all the little stuff. Cause, and then there will be big stuff, but it's like, we're, we're just strengthening that muscle. It's like, yeah, there is something to this. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that gets, you know, one of the things I think that makes intuition a lot easier is, um, you know, we're, we're not necessarily going where we think we're going. Right. It's like, Hey, what's, what's, you know, or, or if we know to, to take this job, say it's like, because it's going to be the best job, not necessarily. Maybe it's going to be the job that drives you crazy that triggers this like wounded part of you that's actually going to be the greatest thing for your healing process. And so, so that's the piece of like, we, we want to, our, our logic wants to make the right decision. Our intuition is, is leading us into the thing that would serve us the most. Right. That's because, you know, with that, there's no right or wrong. There's just yeah. the, the path. Yeah. Yeah. So I had this really great one um, with, with money, like, you know, money for a long time was a, was a struggle in my life. And, and, I, and it was, it was doing much better. And I had this opportunity to invest the most amount of money I've ever invested before. Mm-hmm. And it was feeling into it. And it was like, yeah, it feels like a yes. And I also had this weird feeling. It's like, I wonder if I'm supposed to lose this money. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And so, and sure enough, it's like, no, I know this is a yes. And uh, I have this weird feeling about it too, that I might lose this money. And and sure enough, that's what happened. Mm. And so when that happened, it was like, wow, I've never lost that amount of money before. And so that was bringing up some feelings. And then there was also this hilarity of like, I knew that's exactly what was going to happen. Hmm. <laughs> and, and that whole process, you know, get, even getting more distance from it on the other side, if it was watching how like, oh my goodness, how much that changed my, my um, relationship with money. Uh, Cause it was like, I, I went through that. Yeah, it was fine. I don't even know. I don't even remember about it now. Right. It's not a thing anymore. Right. It's almost like that. It opened up my relationship with money even more. Hmm. It's like, yeah, are you willing to put money into something that you think you might lose it? And it's like, well, if I know to, yes. And what that gave me was so much more than just making some money off an investment, right? Yeah. Did that, um, so did that experience kind of confuse you at first about your intuition? So knowing that you were stepping towards something that you're intuitively drawn towards, but also knowing that, you know, it could potentially have an, you know, a perceived negative effect in your life. Yeah. I mean, I think it probably gave me more than it took away. Like it's mm. um, like it happened and I was like, oh, I was disappointed from it. But I was also laughing because I knew that's exactly what was going to happen. <laughs> right. Uh-huh. It, it wasn't it wasn't as clear. And it was like in that, you know, I was also appreciating. It's like, wow, I'm glad I can laugh about losing the most amount of money I've ever <laughs> lost before. <laughs> that That's new. I couldn't have done that a year or two ago. Like I would be freaked out. Yeah. And. And so it was like, it was, 
it was showing me how much I've grown and also just oh, continued it even more. Yeah. And those are, I mean, I think those are some of those lessons that stick with us the most, you know, those are the, the hard lessons learned, but also I think it gives us perspective because, you know, like you said, even though you lost money, that was a beautiful lesson that you learned, you know, about yourself, about, you know, how you feel about money and can change our perspective about the situation in general, you know, just because we lost, you know, X amount of money, that might be a lot of money on paper. The lesson that was learned from that and the experience that you got from that made it not like you lost money, it's almost an investment, right? You invested in that lesson that you just learned, you know? And when we can switch our, when we switch our narratives like that, where we, we feel the, uh, the opportunities around us instead of the woes or the struggles or the things like that. And that is a perspective shift. Um, you know, I think that's when a lot of the magic can start to happen and you can realize that you're working with life and life's not working against you. It's just, it might not be playing by the same rules that you were taught because culturally we're taught differently about what's good and bad, what's light and dark, what's, you know, all these things, but you know, what's culturally like take a major cordon in the Western, for for example, a major cordon West is something happy and joyful, but a major cord in the East can be something as far as like around funeral processions. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know, so if you have a, a person from the East that hears a major chord, they might feel, you know, down and low, but over here we're dancing and we're having a good time. Right. And it's just that, that cultural perspective that we have. And then when we can experience something outside of that, that adds to the information that we have and that adds to the experience that we can open ourselves up to now. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. 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 Man, I, uh, <laughs> I struggle with, uh, uh, with money a lot myself. Um, and one of the things that I realized is, um, you know, the relationship that I have with money is that I, I had this arrogance of, I see you for the falseness that you are, right? I see how much of a story has been created around you and I don't agree with it. So I don't accept that story. And my relationship with money like that basically told money to fuck off. And money was Mm -hmm. like, cool, no problem. There's seven and a half billion people in this world I can go play with. I don't need you. And so money decided not to play with me. And for the longest time, like I couldn't retain money. I couldn't keep money. I couldn't make money. And, uh, and it was finally, uh, you know, a friend of mine that we were sitting talking and, and she gave me that perspective of like, well, you keep pushing money away from you. You keep telling money you don't want it. You see through it. And so money's like, fine, fine. I'll go find somewhere else to play with. And so me switching my relationship with money and saying, look, I understand how negative it can be, but I also understand that as a householder, I need a certain amount of money so I can continue to do the work that I do. Right. So I don't need to be a millionaire. I don't need to have all the money in the world. But there is a finite amount of money that I need so I can do my work and feel comfortable doing it and then also, you know, progress that work onto others. And creating that relationship and fixing that relationship and getting the verbiage more into something that was positive instead of something like get the fuck away from me money, um, it started to change that. And, and you know, the, the right amount of money finds me when I need the right amount of money now instead of me always searching and taking jobs that I know are taking me outside of my, my path because of this thing that I feel that I need but I keep pushing away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it was like, it was never about money. It was like what, what you were taught money was, what you saw other people, like, like all the other weird stuff, like all, all the weird stuff that people do with money Yeah, was never about money. Right. It, it reminds me, I, I couldn't use the word God for most of my life because mm-hmm. it's like every time someone was talking about God, I could feel like they don't know what they're talking about. Right. <laughs> Yeah, this isn't a. There's no dude in the sky that's judging you. (laughs) Like that's, that's that's uh, that's a mind that's created this interpretation of something that it can't understand. Mm -hmm. And and then I met somebody. I I I met a man, a friend that, and he was talking. He just kept saying God to me. He he kept talking about God and kept talking about God, and I was so fascinated because I was like, wow, there's there's none of that stuff on it. Mm. Like he's, he's using this word and it's, it's totally clean. It's like, there's none of the judgment. There's none of the other, all the stuff that the religion and all the other stuff in our culture puts into it. And it was like, just being with him and hearing him use it in such a clear way. It, it was almost like, oh yeah, that's more what God is. Mm. And then, and then I was, and then I just started using that. I needed to catch up. I hadn't used the word for so long. So <laughs> I started overusing it because I got a new word in my vocabulary. Right. <laughs> 
Yeah, I had a, I, you know, I, I actually, I still have a, a, a hard time using the word God. Um, you know, like I was saying, I, I didn't grow up religious, but, you know, I grew up in a religious area down in Texas. And, and I saw a lot of the hypocrisy that um, the, the different organized religions offered, um, you know, mm-hmm. from Christianity to baptism, Catholics. Um, and I, you know, I tried to go to church on my own as a teenager and try to find religion, but the, the God thing never really landed with me. And, um, uh, it, and I'm still unraveling it because I know it's a story that's been told to me that it's not the, uh, the, the overarching story. It's just a version of, but the, uh, the whole, you know, repent your sins, crawl on your hands and knees and beg God to forget. Like that never landed with me. I'm like, why would a person that omnipotently loves everybody, no matter what they did, want you to crawl on their hands and knees and beg forgiveness for something that he's going to forgive you for anyways. Right. So why do we need to do that? And that never landed with me until somebody talked to me about spirit. And I'm like, Oh, what's spirit? They're like, well, it's basically it's, it's God, but the spirit is all loving and is all forgiving and is all encompassing. And you can do the worst thing in the world. And that spirit is going to see the good in you and see maybe the deeper reason why you did that, that you might not be able to consciously see as a human and accept you and know that that's part of your path and love you as you kind of figure, figure this out, whether good, bad or indifferent. And that landed with me. I was like, Oh, that's, okay, that, that feels right, you know, because we're all going to fuck up. We have to kind of mess up to figure out what we do and don't want to do. Like, not all of us can go to the world through this world squeaky clean. You know, like, I have to drink all the wine and do all the drugs to understand that that's not a life I want to live and that's not a mindset I want to stay in, right? But it, I would not know that unless that happened to me. And should I be damned forever and go to hell because I found something that didn't work for me and then I found something else? No, we're all just loved. We're all just on this path in our own way. We're just figuring it out. We're going to fall on our faces. We're going to slip and we're going to fall, but there's going to be something there to catch us and love us and say, hey, you're all right. Get up there and you make me proud. Go out there and do, do what you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and so, there, yeah, there's, you know, thousands of different words for, for that spirit or that source or creator or what it like. There's so many words for it. And those are all just the words. Like those are all the, those are all the things that are pointing at the thing that we actually don't have the words to describe or understand. Right. I think they say and, that uh, you know words are the the poet's um, biggest adversary. You know, because mm-hmm. we can look at something and see the beauty and know how much it makes us feel and all these things, but then it it might take a volumes and volumes and volumes of pages and words to actually progress and, and explain that to somebody else. Mm-hmm. When we can just like look at it and be like, oh, that feels beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, You know, and so, and so we were talking about money, money earlier. It's like the same thing with money. It's like, wow, so many things that we've understood about, about money and finances and all this stuff. And we're like, what if it's none of those? Hmm. What what if it's none of the things that I thought it was? And I got to really just be with this as a, as a frequency or be with this as like, Hey, let's, let, let's, let's form a deeper relationship than, than thought. Hmm. That goes against so many, yeah, I mean, and that just, that goes against so much cultural teaching out there for a lot of us, you know, to, to take, take that story, completely flip it and, and, and approach it from a different way. You know, I think that scares a lot of us out there because we've, you know, so many people think that they have got this game figured out, you know, this is the game that I figured out. And for the longest time, like I thought I had this game figured out, right. I had a corporate job. I was making money. I had insurance, all the things, all the, the you know, check boxes on paper that made it look right. But when I sat down and quieted myself, I, I was fucking miserable and I wasn't, I wasn't happy at all. You know, I was drinking too much. I was doing a lot of drugs and just, I just was not in a happy place. And even though I had all these theoretical check boxes of just like things that I was progressing towards and it wasn't until finally, you know, I had, you know, my dark passenger days and it just kind of destroyed me. And from that crawling back up is when I started to find there's something different out there. And, you know, for that, for me, I had to blow up my whole life, you know, to, to, to change that up. And it seemed extremely scary at the time, but, you know, looking back now, I do it a thousand times over, mm-hmm. you know, go totally. through that, for, that, that fear, go through that, that uncertainty and, and build something that you're proud of instead of just accepting something that you're given. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like we all have, I, I think each one of us are, have our own unique thing and it's like, nobody could tell it to you. Hmm. Nobody could show you exactly what you're here to do or be or, or give you some sort of mold or pattern that to, to stuff yourself into. Because when you do stuff yourself into that mold, you're just going to be miserable in it. All <laughs> right. I had to, uh, I had to define my freedom, which sounded counterintuitive at the time. But, um, you know, I, 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 when I found myself away from my corporate jobs, I, uh, I 
just, I, I kind of, even though I was doing something that I love now, I was doing healing arts, I didn't have a definition of what I was working towards. And so all of these external kind of things kept coming into me. Um, you know, I got offered a job to open up a company for air conditioning parts. I got offered a job of going back into restaurants. I got offered a job, like all these things to like take me back into what I had left because I had not defined what I wanted to do yet. So all these opportunities still kept coming at me. And it was kind of confusing because, you know, part of me was like, well, go back to comfort, right? There's stability in that. Now you know what you don't want to work towards and you know what you do want to work towards. So you have a better understanding going into these corporate jobs. But there was still something inside of me that's like, dude, there's no way. That's just not your path. You're going to take it out of everything that you're working towards. And so finally, I had to sit down and listen to my intuition to define what freedom wanted to be for me and how I wanted to structure my freedom and how much I wanted to work and what kind of work and blah, blah, blah. But then that gave me those parameters to look back at when I had these random job offers or opportunity offers to come to me and say, hey, you can make this much money doing this kind of work. These are your hours. And I would put that against what I wanted and what my freedom definition was. And it's like, well, it doesn't meet that, right? It's outside of that. I'm working twice as much as I'd like to. I'm not making money to, to justify that. I'm going to be taken away from my kids. So no, I'm sorry. That's a no, you know, but that gave me that, that, you know, that, that barometer of something to go back towards instead of just, you know, kind of finger in the wind of like, oh yeah, I guess that feels right. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, we gotta we gotta define that sometimes. With uh, right. w yeah, with your healing, um, the work that you do. Um, so we've talked about breath work, uh, but what other kind of healing modalities um, do you utilize in the in the work that you do with individuals or groups? Uh, it, you know, it, it's it's very intuitive. So you know, lots of times I'm surprised. It's like we've never done this before. <laughs> like here's a new, <laughs> here, here here's a new thing. Um, you can, kind of whatever, you know, I, I, I think the breath is, is a part of everything, um, you know, and, and then working in the space and the energy, um, you know, meditation is, is a beautiful, powerful practice. Mm. Um, and then just, yeah, what, whatever else we need, it's, it can look so many different ways. Uh, you know, it might, it might be going into, um, you know, talking about the talking about things or bringing in new perspectives about things. Um, yeah, that's, it's like when you ask that question, it's like, wow, it's so many things. I, I don't even think I have words for some of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think those are, those are some of the best ones, you know, is when the intuition kind of, kind of takes over and, and you don't even realize you're what you're doing, you know? Yeah. I remember there was a yoga teacher I used to um, frequent a lot. I still do. She's, she's fantastic. But when I first started taking yoga, she would always end these end her, end her classes with these beautiful just phrases, beautiful thoughts, beautiful sayings that she would have. <clears throat> and uh, and one day after class, I asked her, I'm like, where do you, do you have like a book that's this stuff that you come up with? I mean, what, what do you do with this? And she's like, I don't even know what I say. I just open myself up and it just kind of comes through. And that, that was one of the first people I met that, you know, told me that they were channeling something. And I'm like, wait a minute, like, how, how does that work? You know? And, uh, but now I, you know, I, I, I can feel that, you know, where, you know, where I'm having sessions or I'm guiding classes or even my sound baths where, you know, I've been trying to work with my, my spirit guides a lot more. And, uh, you know, I have a teacher that's kind of identified himself and as somebody that wants to work with me in a deeper way. And so, you know, calling that person forth and then asking that person to guide my intuition. And then all of a sudden, you know, like my hands are doing things that I never thought they would do. And I'm whistling or I'm chanting something, or there's, you know, these smells or these things that are happening around me that I'm like, well, I have no idea how to explain any of this and I don't really want to. So I'm just going to go with it and just see what happens, you know, and then just getting the feedback from the clients of like, Oh my God, this or that experience or this thing that happened or that thing that happened. I can't believe that. And I'm like, I can't either. Cause I don't really remember it. You know, I'm just, I'm just, I'm a vessel right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that's a beauty you asked earlier about, you know, strengthening intuition and getting more comfortable with it. It's like, that's the very practice, right? Mm. It's like, you go with this, well, I'm just really called to, to do this or, or use this sound or like, like whatever it is that you're doing. And, and then you get incredible feedback from it. And it's like, how did you know to do that? It's like, well, not, didn't necessarily know like that, that it was going to land like that or what it was going to do for you, but maybe I just knew to do this. And then you get the feedback and it's like, See, see, I knew mm. uh, those are all little affirmations and affirmations. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, the beautiful practice. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we got to have those little, little things and pay attention to them to know that the bigger things are possible. 
you know, mm-hmm. to know that, that, that your intuition is just like a muscle. It can grow as big as your biceps, you know, it's just, you got to use it. You got to understand it, give it the time and effort that it needs to, to fully mature into something that, that you can use on a regular basis. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm at a point now in my life where I don't make many logical decisions anymore. It's it's really just like I don't even need to know the details of the question that's being asked. I just you can feel like it's like, yeah, that one. What did I say yes to? Okay, cool. <laughs> that's that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Do you have a feeling in your body for that stuff? I mean, they're like when when you so that example, for example, do you have like a tingling somewhere or, you know, like a like a thought sensation or something like that? I do like I, it's gotten some very clear, um, some very clear feelings in my body in these things. Mm. I actually purposely don't talk about them okay. because um, ju- just because it's like um, that might not be the way that someone else does it, right? Yeah, and so it's like okay, well, let me go look for that and try to match like the way that that I do it, and it's like that might not be the way that it works in you at all, right? And so it's really like to really start from scratch in yourself. It's like, Hey, how do I, what does it feel like when I know something is true? Right. What does it feel like when I know something is false? That's actually a beautiful practice to, to really, you know, when we find alignment, when we find truth, when we really find that connection, it's like, what's that experience that you're having? What does that feel like in your body? And people, you know, maybe it's, Oh, it's really expansive or light and open. Cool. That, that's when you find something that's true or, or real or, or whatever. And, and then it's like, and then what does it feel when you're not there? Like, mm. like, what does it feel like when you think that you're wrong? It's like, Oh, that doesn't feel like that. It's like, what if that's your knowing telling you that's not true what you're thinking? Mm. You know, yeah. I think that I'm, I'm thinking that I'm not good enough. How does that feel in your body? That doesn't feel good at all. It's like, maybe that's your awareness letting you know that that's not true. That's beautiful. What you were saying about not wanting to talk about your personal experiences with intuition or like where you feel it and things, um, you know, I, have, I, don't, uh, I know you're, you're a meditator. Have you, uh, done Vipassana meditation or heard of Vipassana meditation? Uh-huh. So that's, uh, you know, the, the silent meditation retreats that they do. That's one of the, 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 the reasonings behind the, the silent part of it is, um, so that we're not sharing experiences that maybe others aren't having and then them thinking they're doing it wrong. You know, because like you were saying, there's there's no blueprint for this stuff. You know, like my yes on my body might be different than your yes on your body. You know, I might feel it. You might hear it. You know, I might see sound and hear colors. You might just experience a bunch of different things, right? So, yeah, so I, I respect that a lot. That's I've never heard anybody put it that way. Um, a lot of times when I coach people, I try to use my personal experiences to say, like, this is where I felt it or this is what what's happened with me. Um, but, you know, that's... Uh, you know, that, that perspective that you just shared is, is very beautiful. Cause I think there's a lot of times, you know, in, in any healing profession, whether it's medical or, you know, energy work, like we're doing, you know, we have the ability to influence our clients in a positive or negative way based on the verbiage that we use, whether we realize it or not, you know, like somebody saying that, um, you know, like a practitioner having somebody on their table and saying, Oh, look at that. Your heart chakra is blown out. It's like, wow, well, that's, that's a, that's a, big vocabulary word blown out. Like, how do I know what blown out is? Like, you know, yeah, am yeah. I, and, and am I now progressing and projecting that idea onto you? And now you think your heart's all fucked up, right? Mm-hmm. When I can just say, Oh, we're just going to do a little work around your heart chakra today and just see what that does, you know, and not say good, bad, or indifferent. We're just going to do some work. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's presenting how we present that information, how we present that scenario that allows that person to have you know, maybe a placebo effect or a nocebo effect. You know, if I tell somebody that, that this air energy center in their body is messed up, then they might go around the rest of the day, like hovering over that area or finding like, you know, pain or suffering in that area when there's really nothing wrong there. Totally. Yeah. They, and you can create something that wasn't there before by, by getting fixated or resisting it. Um, you know, the one, one thing that came in just for anyone that's listening to this, like, uh, like there's nothing bad going on in you. Hmm. Right. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting stuff going on in us. None, none, of, none of it's bad. Like it's all, you know, what, whether, whether it's some sort of disease or, or, you know, emotional stuff, it's like it, all of these are our doorways into ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so like they're, and, and they're part of our human experience, right? Like when, you know, somebody has a, somebody has a significant significant thing going on, say some sort of significant illness. It's like 
to really look at it like this is this is your journey this is this is this beautiful opportunity this is going to give you so much growth it's going to give you so many opportunities to find deeper and deeper parts of you mm. um and and to treat it like that it's amazing how much faster people heal wow it's like wait what if what if this was a friend okay here's this challenge i'm having what if this is actually a friend and instead of fighting against it we actually get to be friends and be on the same team and work together and see what this is actually trying to show me and that changes the story you know, that change, totally. then, you know, like we were saying, we, we love stories. So instead of penning this negative story of like, oh my God, I am cancer now. It's like, okay, what is this beautiful gift trying to show me about myself that yeah. I didn't know ahead of time? Like, yeah, how totally. is it? Maybe I need to slow down. Do I need to eat, change my diet? Can I have more peaceful practices? You know, what is that? What is this beautiful gift trying to show me instead of like, oh shit, now I, I, I'm this disease. Yeah. I've, I've said to people many, so many times, it's like, you know, the biggest obstacle to healing is trying to heal. <laughs> it's like, cause we get into like, we're like, well, I'm going to fight this thing. Like they're fighting cancer. It's like, that is not you fight fighting cancer has cancer fighting back. It's like, that's that, um, it, it, that's not how it works. And so it's like to getting out of that space of like, this isn't something to fight against. Right. Like this is actually something to harmonize with. This is something that, you know, if we're talking about cancer, it's like, here, this is a part of ourselves that we've cut ourselves off from. And then we're trying to get rid of it even more. It's like, actually, the healing comes in the in the integration with it. Right. There's a, um, I'm not sure if I'm uh, familiar with this gentleman, but, uh, Dr. Zach Bush, he's been um, kind of doing a bunch of speaking yeah. stuff. Right? Beautiful love human. Guy. Yeah, yeah, right. Love and that guy. The, the way he talks about, uh, so he was an oncologist for a while, and he studied uh, cancer in humans and cancer in animals. And um one of the things that he found was, you know, a couple of things was that, you know, domesticated animals have almost 60 to 7%, uh, 70% cancer because of the type of food that they're being fed now, the environment that's outside of what their traditional like eating habits and things like that. But the difference is, is that, so with cancer with animals and cancer with human, the treatments are very similar, right? There's surgeries, there's, um, there's medicines, there's chemo, there's radiation, things like that. But the difference is, is that when, when animals, let's take a dog, for example, let's say a dog has a tumor they go in and surgically remove that tumor. The animals have a 90% success rate with curing or, or re, you know, uh, coming out of cancer after the, the treatments have been administered. But humans, same kind of similar, uh, you know, scenarios after the cancer is removed, after that tumor is removed surgically, typically will go back into having cancer. And what they're finding is it's, or not finding yet, but a hypothesis that he's thinking about is the difference of consciousness, right? So the mm -hmm. consciousness of an animal is very different than the consciousness of a human. Like we don't really fully understand the, the consciousness of an animal, but what they're looking at is that the story the animals tell themselves, they're not as tied to stories as we are. So when you remove the cancer, the animal's like, cool, I'm a dog again. But the human is like, well, but I'm still cancer. I have these cells that aren't connected, and so I have, I'm cancer. And so they go back to having tumors again, or the tumors metastasize, or they grow bigger. And so just that, that the strength of the story that we tell ourselves, how bad that story can be, but also how beautiful the story can be. Like if we have the story of abundance, we have the story of I am love, I am surrounded by gifts that maybe I don't understand, but are always around me and that I have the opportunity to tap into whenever I need to. But you know, it's just changing our dialogue, changing the way that the stories land with us. Yeah, the, 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 there's like a trickiness, though, in that, you know, saying like saying positive affirmations or whatever. It's like, I am abundance. It's like, that's usually poor people that say that, right? Like, <laughs> so, and so it's not coming. It's, 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 it's actually, it can get used as a way to still combat this hmm. thing that I don't, that I don't want. And so it, like, it's different if you're actually like find it in yourself. It's like, Oh my God, I am abundance. Right. Like, that, that's coming from your deepest truth rather than I'm, um, if I say this enough, I'm going to make this other thing go away. Right. Um, so, so, so that, and that's the thing. And, and absolutely, you know, animals don't do that either. That, that's a beautiful study. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah. Um, He's a, you know, like I was saying, I just, I love the way that man speaks. Uh, there's just totally. a lot of stuff that he, uh, that he approaches in a very different way that I've heard. And it really lands either in the, just because I've never heard it before, or just, you know, you could tell he's put a lot of thought into, 
you know, what he's putting out there in the world. And, uh, you know, like people like Charles Eisenstein, you know, there's just these beautiful humans out there that are putting out very well thought out information and uh, in different perspectives that might be outside of the cultural norms. And, you know, if, if, if there's anything I learned from COVID is we got to listen to the people that are fucking putting their hands up, whether they're right or wrong, they're outside of what the normal narrative is being told. So let's listen to what's being said. Like why we shouldn't just always follow the common narrative. Let's look outside of that box and then find out if it lands with you or not. That doesn't mean you have to take it as gospel, but just hear what the people have to say and then see if that lands with you. Yeah, totally. I, I, I mean, I think with all of, you know, when I see all the crazy stuff, it's like you have all the narratives, you have all of these different things. It's like, it's sort of like the next survival of the fittest is survival of the intuitive. Mm. It's like survival of the ones that are really, you know, I always give the example. It's like, you know, you can go into a grocery store and it all says that it's food, but half of that food is going to kill you if you eat it every day. And so it says food on the package, but, but, but does my body actually want to eat that? Right. And so it's like, wait, what, what, what do I know to eat? What, what, what's going to be most nourishing for my body? What do I know about that? You know, these crazy narratives, these people are trying to scare you this way. These guys are trying to scare you this way. It's like, well, well, actually, when I tap into my heart, what does my heart know about this? Right. Like, where do I need to be? Do I need to fill a room with my house with survival goods or whatever? And it's like, no, that doesn't feel like I need to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I think teaching people to to start to think and th- think through their heart or even through their gut, you know, like we were saying about intuition earlier, you know, we're we're so used to this logical brain making all the decisions, but now, you know, with the high heart bios field information that's coming in and the research they're doing, you know, they're understanding now that most of the information, the sensory input information comes into your heart first and then is either put up to your brain or down to your gut depending on where it needs to go. But, you know, this this heart is, you know, that heart forward kind of idea. Like we we take so much information in and we feel so much we've just been taught to ignore it for so long, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. it's really awakening, reawakening a lot of us that, that idea of the, the senses that we feel actually have information behind them. Mm-hmm. You know, like I grew up in the South and, and it was kind of counterintuitive. Um, you know, we're, we're always told to trust our gut, right? Trust your gut, trust your gut. Mm-hmm. But the overall narrative around intuition down South was that it's, it's, it's women's work and it's witchery. Right. And so we shouldn't listen to our intuition. Right. But you're always told to trust your gut. It's like, well, I'm so confused now right? because I'm, t- I'm being told that as a man, uh, you know, intuition is is women's work and it's it shouldn't be looked at because it's feminine. But then I'm also at the same breath being told to trust my gut. You know, so there's like these these counter messages that keep going back and forth. You know, granted, we're, we're now getting into a place where we're more accepting with understanding that there is intuition and that that is a sense that we have, that is something we can cultivate, that is something that we can work towards and, and not just abandoning all these feelings because of, you know, what was used to be called woo woo stuff. You know, it's like mm-hmm. these things do have important places in our lives and in our bodies. They've just been so quiet for so long. We're, we're forgetting how to listen to them. Mm-hmm. And it- you know, it, it was the way that, that everyone did it before. It's like once you started having religions come in and people putting themselves in between you and God, now don't listen to your heart, listen to me. I'll tell you what God said. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, uh, I did a show a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about nature and, and things like that. And one of the, uh, I, you know, just researched the definition of nature. And the Webster's Dictionary uh, definition is, I'm paraphrasing, but basically it says, um, all things that are created naturally trees, rivers, outside, uh, everything outside of what a human is and what humans construct. So basically it's saying that nature is everything except for humans and what humans can make. But we're from nature. We are nature. We've evolved from nature. We're tied to nature. I mean, just look at how like, you know, mushroom uh, medicines of of psychedelic and non-psychedelic kinds just mesh perfectly with our bio. You know, with uh, it's just like the the fibrousness of the the mushrooms works perfectly with our gut biome, you know, and things like that. So, like, how can we remove ourselves from nature when that's what we've progressed from? Like, it's just and again, that's just so counterintuitive. The culture of where we've become to and what we're moving away from. Yeah, and that definition was created by a miserable person. <laughs> 
I could feel that. I can definitely feel that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that that person is not very happy. Oh man. Yeah. I uh I, I my jaw, like I haven't had many jaw dropping moments recently, but that was one of those of like, damn, okay, that's just what we're teaching kids now, huh? That we're not nature. We're everything every, nature is everything but us. So Yeah. And that's, you know, all the kids that read that, it's like, hey, well, feel into that if that's actually true or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And, you know, kids have the strongest intuitions, you know, they, they have that beautiful, like kind of tapped inness that, that, uh, whether it's their, you know, they're, they're so young and innocent that they haven't been affected by the stories that we have out there, or, you know, there's the concepts that you know, actually Zach Bush talks about this too, of how, uh, when you're young, your, um, your cells can hold more light. Um, and because they can hold more light, we have more connection to that ethereal space that we used to be in, you know, and as we get older, our, the, the way our cells operate, they don't accept in as much light. And so that connection starts to diminish over the years, but while they're young, you know, there's still that beautiful connection of, of, of awe, of inspiring, of this intuition that they naturally have. But, um, you know, I, I can say for, you know, people that I've grew up around that, you know, a lot of that intuition, a lot of those stories that were told as children were told, we were told not to say like, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's nice little Johnny. You have a special friend uh, and imagine it. Don't, okay. S screw that friend off. Go outside and play with your brothers and sisters, you know? And, but now, uh, you know, there's people like Mateus Stefano out there that have been encouraged to utilize these stories and to sit with these ideas as a child, as a child. And now in his, 30s, I think he is, you know, he claims to have the idea that he can remember all of his past lives, you know, and, and a lot of that was because he attributes that to his parents encouraging those stories instead of dismissing those as just childhood type of things, you know, and so like having children now, you know, my kids are older, they're 13 and 18. But, you know, I was trying to encourage those stories as they were kids too, of like, no, talk about those weird things. Talk about your imaginary friends. Talk about all these stuff because like, I don't know, it's not true. Who am I to say just because I can't see what you're seeing that that that's bullshit. You know, yeah. My my curiosity not not necessarily that it's a thing where your cells get older and can't hold the light. I feel like it's um like as you get older, you just you. Uh, it's really easy to to just understand more about yourself and the world, and it's almost like locking it down more. Like, it's almost like it, the the more and more that we understand, the more possibilities that we cut out. Because mm. we really get into it. it's like no, this is who I am. This is what the world is. This is how it works. I'll never do this. This is impossible. It's like we live in these very limited stories and it's like none of those are true. Yeah. And you're just exper you're you're experiencing if if you're so caught up in in the thoughts of what's not possible, that's what you don't you just don't see all the stuff that that, that contradicts that. There's a there's a Japanese concept called a beginner's mind. And I think the Japanese word is ikigao, I think it is, but I, I might be mistaken, but um, the concept of beginner's mind. So the, the very first spiritual book I ever read, I don't remember how it came across my path, but, um, it was called, it's a Zen mind, beginner's mind by Shunju Suzuki. And that book changed my life. And it's basically just like, a um, transcribed, um, uh, talks that he had, the Dharma talks that he would have after his sessions, meditation sessions in like the fifties and sixties down in uh, California. And, uh, but the beginner's mind concept is that, you know, when we approach things with the experience that we have through life, the, the good, the bad, and the different, we're limited on the successes that we have to solve a problem because we're just going off of the pattern that what's worked and what hasn't worked. But when we can approach a situation from a beginner's mind to where even if it's coloring this page that I've colored a thousand times, but I'm going to look at it differently and not see that image of a frog, I'm going to see an image of something else, maybe an abstract image. Instead of using green, I'm going to use purple, right? And so we, when, when we approach things in these beginner's mind, everything is an opportunity and everything is an option. And we're not limited by those successes that we've had in the past. And when I first heard that, I'm like, well, then why do we look at successes? You know, the one with, I mean, if we have success with something, then shouldn't we repeat that? And the way it was explained to me is that, you know, well, your success back then was with a different mindset, right? Maybe your failure back then was with a different mindset. And now you have this you know, new set of skills that you've learned. You might even have new people around you that have surrounded you with different skills, right? And so approaching something that you may have failed at in the past, now you have an ability to succeed at because your toolbox is bigger. You're, the way that you approach is differently. And in the same breath, like because I had success with something in the past, I'm going to approach it with that same amount of try to success with this one, but I'm going to fail because... 
I didn't, I didn't absorb the, the resources and the knowledge that I have now to apply it to this new way because I could have had more success with a different attack plan to it. Right? Mm-hmm. And so like having that beginner's mind is just such a good practice and it's, but it's really hard. It's kind of counterintuitive at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, a few phenomena are coming in, you know, one of them is like, you know, we, we do something magic. We do something out of the box. We do something we've never experienced it before. It came through us or, or, or we were part of it. And, and then right on the other, and then afterwards, it's like your mind is trying to recreate it again, but it's like, it wasn't your mind that created it in the first place. And so it was like, it was probably an area of, of, of real openness or beginner's mind or um, curiosity. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, these, these wonderful minds are, are funny. Yeah. They're amazing. And it's like, we, we relax them. There's this other phenomenon that I always see. It's like, I think people have profound spiritual experiences all the time, but if they're too far outside of somebody's box, like if it's, if it's like, no, that's not possible. They, it just, it gets totally forgotten. They mm-hmm. don't even realize that it happened. And so I've, I've, I've watched it happen with, with quite a few people where it's like, you know, there was an experience that happened and they just didn't remember it the next day. Right. Um, and it was like, cause there was such a fixed, like, no, this is the way that the world works and that is not possible. And so it didn't happen. It's like, no, it happened, but you're, it, it doesn't fit into to the small box of context that you have right now. Mm-hmm. As we start relaxing that box, letting that box get bigger. It's like, really, what, what if really anything is possible? Right. Right. And it really is. I mean, I, one of my favorite Einstein quotes is if you believe something can be a miracle, you have to believe everything can be a miracle. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like these miracle moments that I've experienced in life, um, I, I can't explain them. I have no idea where to even start. Like I'm just looking back at them, but those are those, the, the gnosis that, that internal knowing of like that, that was exactly what needed to happen. I don't know if I could ever recreate it. I don't know if I could ever explain it, but that was the beautiful, that was the beauty of that moment, right? Mm-hmm. Not recreating it is, 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 uh, as beautiful as just the experience of it itself, mm-hmm. you know? And that's, you know, that's, I think, you know, a lot of that intuitiveness, like we want to, in science, we want to be able to recreate, you know, that's how we have scientific evidence is the repeatable patterns of these, these experiments that we have. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what another quote that I love that I just heard recently is random and chance are just universal laws that haven't been recognized yet. So these, these things that we consider random and, and, and chance, you know, like there's these pattern making people out there, whether it's an AI or an actual human being that can see a pattern in something that's random. Maybe we just haven't realized it yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like there are miracles happening right now. We just might not be aware of them exactly in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Love that, man. Love that. Well, where, uh, so you do a lot of, um, uh, online courses, you do a lot of traveling. Um, so there's a, just a lot of content that you're putting out there, which is beautiful. Um, so like, uh, talk to me about the, your, uh, the courses that you have online. I, I noticed, I think three on there. Um, let's see. Yeah. R- right now I've, I've been doing for the last six or seven years. Uh, it's a, a series called the harmony series. We, mm-hmm. we usually just take a topic and, and dive in. Like the concept of that is everything like absolutely everything is a doorway into into more of ourselves so mm. um, so we just take something and dive in and open it up and it usually turns out getting really cool um so yeah i do those um and you know currently i'm on the road a lot doing doing breathwork events uh, i do retreats five times a year here in sedona mm. um yeah then, then who, who knows <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of other random stuff too is going on, but, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what took you on the road? Like what took you out of Sedona and decided to make this uh, a kind of a tour kind of idea? Uh, I, I, I just love, um, you know, just, just called, called, called the places. And it's like, um, you know, the, the, that's my favorite is getting to, to be with people. Um, I, I think the most, the most beautiful thing to me in the entire world is to be, to just to be the witness of somebody that's just, you know, found themselves or they find a deeper truth or they, they, they wake up to how amazing they are or, or realize this, and, you know, just realize that this story that they've been telling themselves, it's like, wait, that's not true. And, and you watch them light up from it. And so um, it's like, I get to see the, you know, it's like going to the grand Canyon 12 times every day or whatever, like just getting to watch all these beautiful moments and, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if I know why I do it, but it's just, just what I'm here to do. Yeah. 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 Does it, when did you finally notice that, you know, 
you felt like you were doing what you meant you were meant to do. Do you remember that feeling or that moment? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's happened many times. Um, you know, there, there, there's been, um, there's been many like just mystical moments. It's like where you just know the entire universe all lined up for this, this moment right here, right now. And it's just, it's just the best. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, there's just been so many of those and, and, and I love them every time they happen. Yeah. They're so mystical, you know, and then each one, I mean, for me, they, they've, they've, it's kind of weird because I, I know the feeling, but they've all felt very different. Totally. Right. But there, but there is like this underlying, like completeness or, um, like breath of fresh air, or just like this, this peaceful feeling of like, you're, you're doing exactly what you need to do, whether it's like surrounded by synchronicities or whatever it is that's, that's like, you know, laying that foundation for that feeling. But there is, man, when, when you're on that right path and, and those, those things start to light up, it just, there, there is that gnosis of just like, you, you know, where you need to be. Yeah. And I actually, I, I think everyone is on their right path. Mm -hmm. Um, like there's, there is a, I've asked this question to so many people. It's, it's such a fun question to ask. Uh, and I'll ask this to everyone listening to this right now. It's like, when, like when you check in, we got to, we got to set the mind aside for this one. Cause the mind's decided many things about this that aren't true, <laughs> but it's like, when you just feel into, to, to your soul, like what you came here for, what you came here to do, to be, to create, to experience. It's like all of those things. Like, is it possible for you to mess that up? Hmm. Wow. Wow. I think you might've broke my brain on that one. Uh, what, what a relief, right? Right. Like, right. Oh, oh my God. Like what I'm here to, what I'm here to do and be and create and experience. It's like, if you couldn't even mess it up, like how much, how much weight had like, we realized like maybe how much it was like, wow, I was trying not to mess it up. That's where I was running from, but, but you can't mess it up. Hmm. It just opens up this entirely new freedom. There's a, there's a, there's an ease with life. There's, there's a flow. There's, there's a way that we get to be present with absolutely everything even more. Wow. I just felt my shoulders drop whenever you said that. Like, yeah. like it, I felt relief after you said that. Yeah. Cause you know, there's, we, we have no idea how this is all playing out. And if yeah. that is like whatever you would consider a misstep is the best move you've ever made to put you on the, to continue you on your path of wherever you're going. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll share this story real quick. I know that we, uh, that we're running down on time, but, um, when this, when this really like locked into me where I got this so clearly, I had this experience where we, I was doing an event in Canada and I had forgot something at the house and the class is about to start. And so I had to like really quickly get back to, to get back to the house to go pick this up. And, and I start having this experience where I'm driving, but I'm also, I'm in two places at the same time. I'm also living like a minute in the future. Okay. And so everything that's happening to me right now, I know absolutely everything that's going to happen. I know everything that I'm going to see. It's like everything that I'm experiencing has already happened every moment of it. And it's raining and I'm having this experience where I'm like, the, the house was set back down the sidewalk. And it's like, I know that I'm going to just run really fast because I'm running to this house to get the stuff. I know that I'm going to hit that porch, that wet porch, and my feet are just going to fly out from under me, like straight up in the air. <laughs> and I'm just going to come crashing down. And I know that all of this is going to happen and I'm not doing anything to stop it. I'm still like... Just like just speed. very clear. This is what I'm doing full speed. <laughs> there was no thought about not doing it. And so when I'm laying on the ground, soaking wet, oh, you know, <laughs> tore my clothes up. I, I was just laughing hysterically because it was, that was one of those moments that was like, this was one of those perfect moments uh, that was absolutely going to happen, whether I wanted it to or not. <laughs> and it was like this, you know, um, you just just a, this is a beautiful moment. This is, that was one of the things where that where that really started dropping in. It's like, wait, there are things that I came here to experience that that that, that I came here to experience. And so, yeah, well, let, let's just keep receiving what the day brings me. Like, you know what? I might have a rough one today. I might all kinds of things might go wrong today. Yeah. Instead of making somebody wrong for it or do, making myself wrong, it's just like what does that feel like? What is that giving me the opportunity to feel or, or be with or be present with? So, um, wow. Yeah. It's like, we, we can't, I don't, we, we can't mess it up. That, that's it's just it's an entire, it's such a relief.
That is, man. Gosh, that is. Uh, I'm gonna be noodling on that for a while. Like, it reminds me of something that Ram Das, uh, Ram Das said back in the day. It's uh, he was talking to his, uh, his uh, what he would call his spook friend Emmanuel, this uh, spirit entity that spoke through another channel to him. Uh, said to him one day, well, um, Rob Doss, you're on the, this, you're in this human experience. Why not learn the curriculum, right? Be a fucking human being, understand the mm-hmm. full spectrum of the human emotions, understand the good days, the bad days, understand that your perception of good might be not good. And your perception of bad might not be bad, right? It's all what you are, but you're not going to figure it out until you become a human, right? Stop trying to be and live in this ethereal spirit plane, be a human for a little bit, right? Learn, learn what it's like. That's why we're here. Yeah, totally. Yeah, well, it's like we came from spirit to have the human experience. Why are we trying to be some? Why are we trying to be in spirit all the time? Right. Yeah. 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 And that—that's a paradox. I heard somebody say that the other day, and I'm like, oh my god, like that makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, if I wasn't meditating all the time, I'm afraid I'd just have a bottle in my hand. You know. So you know, it's like I'm taking one for the other. But you know, addiction can manifest itself in many different ways, whether what's perceived good or bad. So it's finding the balance of. Okay. Yes, I, I understand that I'm a you know I'm I'm a light of of a spirit of some sort. You know I have this thing that I'm looking towards, but I'm also in a human body, and I have this job to do, to, this experience to learn, this this you know culture to understand, or whatever it is. Like mm-hmm. take the time to learn that. Know that that spirit's there, and it'll always be there to hold you. But also like figure out this human stuff too. Yeah, and and that because that's that's usually I I often tell people you know, all of the things that we're looking for is found in the things that we don't want to look at. <laughs> and so, you know, like, like, like talking about addiction, it's like that, that's a way to kind of, you know, uh, change the way that we feel or change the way that we experience where it's actually like the invitation is like, Hey, when something's comfortable, can you allow yourself to feel it more? Mm. Right. Can you find, and my two favorite practices in the world are breathing and relaxing. It's like you start breathing and relaxing. Every time you relax your body a little more, you can feel more. Hmm. And so, and it's like, okay, cool. Now, now I actually get to meet this because it's right. It's hard to feel something when we're fighting against it. Right. Like when we're, and, and, it, but, but it needs to be felt. It wants to be felt. It's like, it's that, that is the, the integration that's happening. It's like, well, when I can actually just sit and allow and feel this. Okay, now now I get to meet it. Now I get to find. Now I actually get to know what it really is, and it was never what I thought it was. Right, but it's quieting ourselves down enough and giving ourselves that space to to hear it for what it truly is, and not what we're expecting it to be. Yeah, because I mean, we didn't come here to avoid anything, and it's it's in those things that we avoid is often some of our greatest teachings, some of our greatest openings or awakenings. It's like. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm feeling really uncomfortable right now. And I want to, I want to do something about it to distract myself from it. Instead, it's like, what if I come back and just be uncomfortable? Yeah. Lean into it. Yeah. 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 Teachers manifest themselves in the strangest of ways. You know, like we, we have no idea that that was a teacher for us until we can accept the fact that like we're being taught something, put the ego aside, put the preconceived notions aside, take out the beginner's mind and just sit with your intuition and see how it lands with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had, I think I had, you know, functional depression for a, a big chunk of my life. Mm. Like, a, cause I was, I was really good at running from it. Like I was, <laughs> I mean, I was a professional athlete and I, I, I could always like working out, I could always feel better. Yeah. And I realized, I realized that it's like, Oh wait, working out was always an avoidance <laughs> and I was avoiding a lot. So I worked out a lot. <laughs> my yoga practice turned into that for a little while for me. I realized yeah. I was using my yoga practice to run away from life instead of utilizing as that healing modality that it started out as yeah and the, and so there was there was a profound experience that i had where it was like i was it was like almost like a, a, a deep funk coming on like a depression and i had a i had a bike race or a bike ride scheduled for that day and i was like i was like i know that riding my bike will make me feel better but i know that it's not time to feel better and so instead i just sat there a couple hours and just really spent some time feeling and, and being with the the sensation the energy the frequency rather than what i even thought this was really just surrendering to whatever these feelings were and yeah it was like a, it was like a two-hour funk wow i also got the like the this you know the the awareness or the download that came with it it was like i used to turn this into like a you know a, a six-month thing or a four-month thing like 
from from always running from it, stretching it out. It's like it was a two hour funk in my day that right. I used to turn into that I used to turn into like a six month funk. Wow. And that's just sitting with that sensation instead of trying to run from it and prolonging it. Yeah. That's you know, and that's you know, I have a friend of mine that talks a lot about how um, you know, we're we're conditioned now to not sit with sensation. We want to we want to move on to the next thing as soon as possible, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's gratification or whether it's depressive feelings. You know, we don't want to sit with those intense sensations. We want to move on to the next thing. But sitting with that intensity, you know, sitting with that sensation is probably the medicine that we need. Just like you said, you know, the two hours turn, you know, was went from two hours of you sitting with your, with your thoughts and that feeling rather than six months of, or six weeks of working out through it and trying to run from it and push away from it. And it just lingering and lingering and lingering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sit with those sensations, do with yeah. the deal with the difficult while it's still easy. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've been doing that for a long time now. So now like when, you know, shit's hitting the fan in some way, there's also this excited part of me too. It's like, okay, cool. Here's, we, we, we got a 30 day notice last summer that we were getting, uh, you know, they, they're kicking us out of their house, out of the house that we were living in. Okay. Um, and it was like, you know, it's like, you got 30 days to move. It was like, Oh wow. That's, that's a surprise. I didn't know I was moving this month. And there was, there was all kinds of feelings that came up in that. And then there was also this excited part of me that was like, what else would, what else would make me feel this way? Mm. What else would give me the opportunity to feel this combination of, of intensity and energy and all that stuff. And so, um, you know, it, it, it was, uh, it, it was powerful and profound and, um, um, I'm so grateful for it. Yeah. And just changing the narrative, you know, instead of accepting it for what perceived to be negative, you know, you saw the possibility and the opportunity in it. And I think that's, you know, with a lot of this stuff that happens in our lives, it is an opportunity for us to get out of our, our pattern making machines or what, you know, whatever pattern that we've gotten ourselves into, whatever comfort, whatever normality and change something up, you know, change is one of the hardest things we'll ever do in the world, but that's how we grow. Like I had a friend tell me one time, you don't grow sitting on the beach, drinking margaritas with your feet in the sand. I mean, that's fun you know, but your growth happens when your face is getting dragged across the concrete by the hair. And you're like, fuck man, when is this going to stop? It's going to stop when you learn your lesson and you start to embrace what's happening around you and, and find a way to let this work with you instead of work against you. Mm-hmm. Right. And what's cool too, the, it's like the, the, the more that becomes a practice too, you'll catch it much quicker than, than before you get to the point where you're getting your face dragged across the concrete, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, like these, these things are all whispers first. Right. By the time it gets to that, it's like we've been ignoring it for quite some time. Yes, yes. So. And I've been uh, been practicing listening to those whispers so they don't become that face-dragging kind of uh, ordeal that, oh, that I'm totally, totally used to now. I mean, that, that's what I would choose too. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Zach, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate all your time and your wisdom. Uh, really great time talking with you. Uh, so you're going to be in Vegas uh, in the next couple weeks, is that right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be there this week. This um, week, okay. I'm trying to think of where else I um, I have I have some Colorado stuff uh, like Boulder, Denver. I'll be in Utah. Um, trying to think of where else I will be. Have a retreat coming up next month. Nice. But but yeah, the, all that stuff, all that stuff's on my website. Perfect. Yeah, I'll leave uh, uh, links to the show notes uh, and for your website, uh, how to get in contact with you, Instagram, all that stuff. Um, and Zach, thank you again, brother. I appreciate what you do in this world, all the, the, the healing that you're putting out there and, uh, and your time and your knowledge, man. Thank you so much, brother. Oh, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. All right, brother. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks so much for spending time with Zach and I check out the show notes for any links to get in touch with Zach and see what he's up to, where he's off to next. And please like, or subscribe to the show, send it to your friends. Well, base and love. We'll see you guys next time.